Well, all right, good morning, everybody. It is eight o'clock and it's time for zoology. Okay, well, I see we've already got a couple of people in the chat. That is good to know. I'm not really here alone. I got some folks paying attention. Nice. Um, <clears throat> all right, so if you haven't tapped anything into the chat yet and you're still with us, let us know that you're here. All right, be awesome. <sighs> it's weird, isn't it? You're probably in your pajamas still, aren't you? I'm not. But I do have my coffee. This is probably the best thing about the whole situation. We can all have our coffee while we're in class together. Isn't that good? I think it is. All right. Um, trying to just go through some general information, and we're going to stall for a little bit of time while we um, hopefully let other people remember to get all logged in and, and signed up and everything. Um, uh, recent communications from the school. You're spooked. <laughs> uh, is it me? Am I spooking you? It could be. I mean, this is, again, this is weird. You're watching your professor on your device. Okay. Um, anyways, back to just um, general information, uh, communication from the district. Nothing new has really been announced as far as how long we're going to be on this um a remote learning kind of mode of operation. Um, officially, nothing has changed, and we're supposed to return to normal classes um, after spring break. If I hear anything different um, before you guys get any of that information as well, um, we'll certainly let you know. Um, so at this point, I'm trying to keep everything as normal as possible. Um, so things like uh, laboratory notebooks, which I know were due, um, I think, before spring break. Um, obviously not going to be able to turn those in until, um, after, um, so, um, so we're just going to maybe adjust that deadline, um, along those lines there. Um, and so we'll just keep that, um, exam number two, again, also I still want to schedule, I believe for April 7th, um, again, unless we extend this breakout. Um, I will have to make some adjustments as far as when the exam is going to happen. Um, okay. Oh, class has actually started, so hold on, let me fix that. There. Yeah, that's a little better slide to have right now. All right. Um, so I'm trying to think, anything else of a general bit of business that we need to take care of? Um, I don't know. Anybody got any questions out there on um, issues uh, pertaining to um, this rather unusual period in history that we seem to be experiencing together? All right. Perhaps not. All right. So with that, let's... Um, I guess let's just kind of start the, okay, there we go. Taylor, all right, is asking the question, is the study guide still the same for this exam too? Um, good question. We're a little behind schedule um, because I believe study guide two has us extend all the way through um, respiratory systems, which will come after cardiovascular systems. Hopefully, if I can maybe catch up some ground here over this uh, next week and a half, um, we might be able might be able to do that. We'll see. Um, I guess one thing that's going to go a little bit quicker. I'm not going to be spending a lot of time handwriting notes on a whiteboard, so I might actually be able to go through the information a little bit faster. A lot of what I would write um, is now on PowerPoint slides, so um, you guys will be able to um, get that through the video. Um, go back and replay it if necessary. And actually, I will probably upload this updated PowerPoint into Canvas and uh, replace it with the one that's already there. So you should have all that information. Um, so hopefully I can keep up the pace and still get everything that I want to have in the exam on time. All right, uh, next question. Regarding our projects, uh, again, that's the other thing that's gotten a little bit iffy um, since I kind of lost I mean, I haven't really lost the potential. I could still um, try to get the animals, except I lost my laboratory tech who 
buys the animals for me. Uh, and so I don't really have anything to really to provide you guys that I promised to provide you. So, and again, I'm still waiting for the shoe to drop because although officially the school is planning on returning to normal operations, I honestly don't think that's going to happen. I think given all of the health advisories that are going out and the way that um, different communities are responding to the situation, this is going to go on longer. And my personal opinion, we could be in this all the way through to the end of the term and the entire semester is going to be done remote instruction. If that turns out to be the case, definitely projects are going to have to be canceled. Um, regrettable. Um, but considering, again, everything that we're all dealing with right now, having one less thing on our plates is probably for the best. So um, I'm going to make a final decision about projects um, by our next class meeting on next Tuesday. Hopefully I'll have concrete information as to what's going on with uh, school in that regards. But if I were playing odds on it, I'd say two to one odds that I'm going to end up canceling the projects. So if you haven't started, I wouldn't stress at this point. So um, just being honest with you. And there was a great sigh of relief throughout the land. Right. Cool. Okay, so let's go and let's get into the lesson here. All right, so um, we're gonna look at kind of the, the next aspect of animal biology, which is cardiovascular systems. So cardiovascular systems, this is other, also known as circulatory systems. All right, but I kind of like the term cardiovascular because it really gets into um, the components here. All right, because, you know, what exactly does this system do? Well, um, it, delivers materials all around an animal's body. All right, now we're gonna focus our attention on vertebrate systems here. All right, now what's interesting about vertebrate circulatory systems, and you've gotten some good experience looking at them because you've looked at the shark and you've looked at the fetal pig and you've looked at a big heart and all of that. So you're pretty familiar with a lot of the anatomy of the systems, but kind of putting it in the bigger picture, these are what we call closed circulatory systems, meaning that the blood, the fluid that is circulated by the system always remains contained within blood vessels. All right. So what that means though is that these systems are designed to deliver materials to cells and tissues and then pick up other materials from those cells and tissues and send them to other places. But what that means is that those substances have to basically be transported across the wall of a blood vessel to get to where they need to go. All right, and then there are, of course, a different variety of vessels, and not all of them necessarily allow for that exchange. And we'll go back and kind of go through the, the list of uh, different types of vessels and their, their roles in the whole system here. All right, but this is, um, I also bring this up just to contrast it, because as we you guys go through the laboratory activities and videos, you're going to be learning that there are a number of animal groups that have a kind of a different type of circulatory system. It's called an open circulatory system. And open circulatory systems are ones where there is a circulating fluid, but we don't really call it blood anymore because one, mostly it doesn't stay within blood vessels. Is that there's, there is a pumping organ, there's an equivalent to a heart, and it keeps the fluid moving around inside the animal's body. But at a certain point, this fluid leaves the vessels and it simply just kind of opens out into larger body cavities and just kind of percolates around all the cells and tissues directly. Right. And so it's, it's just a very different system. It works for a number of animals, um, but usually it's working for invertebrate animals that are often very kind of slow moving, very low metabolism kind of a thing. And um, it wouldn't work for organisms like vertebrates, which are usually larger, muscular, much more active kind of animals. All right. So you'll see some contrast as you go through some of the laboratory animal groups. All right. But let's uh, get back here to vertebrates. All right. So what else? All right. Well, when, again, when you're talking about a circulatory system, there are some basic components to it. There are, of course, a heart. I think we're all very gotten very familiar with vertebrate hearts at this point, looking again both at the shark heart and the pig heart. And as we kind of learned, the major tissue that makes up these organs are is cardiac muscle tissue that you guys have also studied in lab. 
There's other types of tissue too in the heart. There's epithelial tissue covering the external surface and lining the internal um, chambers of the heart. Um, nervous tissue is woven throughout it because you have to kind of um, have some sort of external regulation of heart activity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go through this, uh, through this unit here. Um, but it is by, lar by far mostly cardiac muscle tissue. All right. So you've got that. And then what's the other component? All right, so the other component of a circulatory system, again, are these things called blood vessels. All right, so these are essentially the tubes or the conduits that blood is, travels through and are used to distribute the blood all throughout the animal's body. And we'll take a little more detailed time looking at the construction of blood vessels, but they are made with uh, combinations of connective tissue and smooth muscle tissue um, as well as a lining of epithelial tissue um, on top of that. Um, and so a little bit later in the class, we're going to look at uh, those different varieties. All right. But one thing about blood vessels, though, is that there are kind of different types, and we, we categorize them or name them um, mostly on the basis of um, what direction is blood flowing through these vessels relative to the heart. And that's kind of the most important thing here when you look at the different types of blood vessels. All right. So, of course, we've learned about the larger vessels that are called arteries. You guys even had to learn to identify a few major arteries um, in a mammal. And again, the real definition of an artery, though, is that it carries blood away from the heart and is kind of directing it towards any sort of a major body region or structure. So, you know, we learned about things like the renal artery. So that is the major vessel sending blood to a kidney about the carotid arteries that are delivering blood up into the head and to, particularly into the brain. All right. So those are kind of the, these big diameter vessels. And we also learned about the umbilical artery, which was delivering blood to the placenta, which is a kind of a temporary organ that forms in mammals. All right. So in all of those cases, the blood was flowing away from the animal's heart. And that's really the criteria to be an artery, is that direction of blood flow. It has nothing to do with what color it is in an illustration of a biology textbook, um, and it has nothing to do with the relative oxygen content of that blood vessel. It's just direction. All right. Next we have arterioles. So arterioles are sort of the smaller branches off of the larger arteries, and usually arterioles form within these major organs or other regions of body tissues. All right. And so they kind of help to kind of fan out and distribute the blood kind of once it gets to a major zone or a major area, now it gets uh, distributed a little bit more widely within the organ itself. All right. Um, and then as it continues to kind of spread through the through that organ, there's continual branching into smaller and smaller vessels until finally you get to a fine network of interrelated vessels called capillaries. All right. Now capillaries are very, very thin wall. They're actually made out of a single layer of simple squamous epithelial tissue. All right. So that's important because that is what facilitates the ease with which materials within the blood are able to exit or enter the blood. So this is where exchange happens. So this is where oxygen diffuses out or is delivered out of the blood. Carbon dioxide enters into the blood. We also unload nutrients and pick up waste materials. We deliver hormones. All right. Or pick up hormones because hormones, of course, are specifically chemicals that are transported via the bloodstream. All right. So all of the exchanges happen here. And honestly, although we spend a lot of time talking about the heart and talking about the, the other types of blood vessels, if to really understand circulatory systems, you need to understand this. Capillaries are really the heart and soul of circulatory systems. All right. They're the essential component because this is the whole purpose of the system. The whole purpose of the system is to allow for exchanges between tissues and the blood supply. And so if we didn't have capillaries, all we would have is a closed circulating system that just pumped a fluid around for no real purpose. 
So when you think about circulatory systems, you have to recognize that the capillary exchange is the whole point, and therefore that's really the most important part of the system. All right. Now that doesn't dismiss the importance of things like the heart, because without the pump to make the fluid circulate, it doesn't really work very well either. All right. And so all these components are really very well integrated, and to a larger extent, maybe they're all completely necessary. All right. So once blood reaches capillaries, and particularly when oxygen is given off and carbon dioxide is picked up, now it's time for blood to get back to the heart to maintain circulation. And so blood then travels through venules, which again are kind of the equivalent to the arterioles. They um, um, form as capillary beds um, begin to merge together and then begin to drain the blood out of those tissues and organs. And then emerging from those organs will be the larger veins. And then the veins are gonna return the blood all the way back to the heart again through um, a major network. So again, we've learned about some of the larger veins like the jugular veins and the brachiocephalic veins, the renal veins, and probably again, in at least in um, most vertebrates and particularly in mammals, you have uh, things like the cranial and caudal vena cavi, which are the ones that go directly back to the right atrium of a mammalian heart. All right, so we've got all of those examples to think about. All right, so what's interesting though is that again, the mammal heart is just only one design and there are many other designs to vertebrate circulatory systems. And what's interesting is that there also seems to be a little bit of a correlation between the type of circulatory system and the overall metabolism and maybe even the evolutionary history of certain vertebrate groups. So here's one that we've already looked at. So um, it's a single loop circulatory system. And again, we've seen this because we've seen the shark and the shark is a gill breathing animal and this is the system that is uh, common to all fishes all right so they all have basically the same kind of structure here so you have a two-chambered heart all right fundamentally two chambers there's the atrium and then the ventricle now again there's sort of those some of those accessory structures that we talked about like the sinus venosus and the conus arteriosus those are technically modified blood vessels that um, are associated with the heart, but technically the heart itself just consists of these two chambers right here. And then the blood is pumped out from the ventricle, and the first destination is through the gills and through gill capillaries, right? You can see those right here. Um, and then uh, the capillaries then merge back together again into new vessels. Um, and for kind of simplicity sake, um, these vessels, even though the blood is kind of still, re is sort of in the direction that will eventually get it back to the heart, we still often refer to these blood vessels on the other side of the gill capillaries as still being arteries. It's just kind of a, a, a quirk, um, maybe a bias as circulatory systems were first um, understood in terrestrial animals and then later terms were applied to to the study of fishes and things like that. So we're still gonna go ahead and call these um, arteries here. And then these arteries then distribute to the rest of the body systems right here. And we go to what are called the systemic capillaries. And this again was where oxygenated blood is delivered to all of the rest of the organs and tissues. And then that coalesces through veins and returns it back to the heart again. All right, so that is our basic circulatory system. Here's the problem with that system though, okay, is that as the blood passes through all of these branches, all right, the main force that causes blood to flow through a circulatory system is actually blood pressure, all right? Pressure is a physical force, it's a pushing force, right? And it's the job of the heart to generate that pressure, all right? But, and we're, we're going to study why this actually happens a little bit later in the chapter. But the big thing to understand is that as you take a fluid and you branch it off into different vessels, 
the overall amount of pressure dissipates because it gets spread as we split the volume of the blood into different units going through different vessels blood pressure begins to drop and without the pressure it's harder to maintain efficient blood flow because we don't have as much force pushing it and so the blood speed kind of drops a little bit as it flows through the rest of the body and why does that matter well because the slower the blood is traveling the less oxygen per minute is being delivered to all of the tissues and because you need oxygen to fuel cellular respiration which makes atp and atp is the coin of the realm atp is what provides energy for all of that metabolism all right. So if you don't have enough oxygen delivery, you can't make as much ATP as quickly, and you can't have a high-speed metabolism. And so this is probably one of the major reasons that um, fishes have a tendency to be ectothermic and poikilothermic. All right. With, again, some exceptions. You know, larger fish species, again, that um, have a lot of muscle tissue, um, they can be um, slightly endothermic, um, but that still doesn't help necessarily with their metabolism. You know, and actually, I think it's pretty amazing that large fish species like large tuna and swordfish and stuff like that are able to swim with such speed and velocity because overall they don't have a lot of you know metabolic power for that level of act muscular activity but they have evolved a lot of other um, aspects of their body plan that do allow them um, to be rather energetic animals in spite of this kind of circulatory system limitation all right so that's really kind of interesting all right now moving on now single loop circulation you've seen and of course you've seen what we have in mammals so called the double loop circulation but there's another pattern that we haven't really studied before it's a double loop circulation but the structure of the heart is a little bit different three chambered heart not a four chambered heart so where do we find this well generally it's associated with amphibians and most species of reptiles all right. And so this was sort of an interesting evolutionary attempt to solve some of the problems of that um, drop in blood pressure and some of that limitation in uh, metabolism as a result of it. All right. So what does this system look like? Well, the blood flows now through two different circulation pathways or circuits. All right. So one of them is kind of a new one. This is called the pulmo cutaneous circuit all right so pomo refers to air all right so this is going to be sending our deoxygenated blood is going to be uh, transported towards the respiratory organs in this case the lungs because um, adult amphibians and reptiles are terrestrial animals and so they have these um, structures called lungs that allow them to get um, gas exchange all right Amit just joined us awesome Good job. Welcome. Okay, so the pulmocutaneous circuit here, um, again, is delivering blood to the lungs. But what's interesting, and this is more really about amphibians than, than reptiles because um, they have different types of skin. But amphibians have a really, really thin layer of skin that is not necessarily very hard. Um, and because amphibians have a tendency to live in damp or moist environments, their skin actually works as a supplement to their lungs because it provides a lot of surface area for the absorbing of oxygen and a little bit of release of carbon dioxide across the skin surface. So for amphibians, their skin is a supplement to their lungs and it helps them to breathe. Right. So blood does get transmitted through the skin and so it's able to pick up oxygen there and so we take deoxygenated blood and then oxygenated and then that blood then returns back to the heart so then it can be passed through what's called the systemic circuit and so the blood gets then get pumped from the heart back out again and then it goes to all of the other organs and tissues of the body that use up that oxygen all right i'm on is here too very good welcome and we're going to send our blood back over here to the um, systemic um, 
capillaries, deoxygenated blood, then it's going to return back to the heart again. And so that's why it's a double loop circulation, because we have these two major pathways here. All right. Again, the big benefit of this type of system is rather than losing blood pressure and losing blood velocity for our oxygenated blood after it's passed through respiratory structures like we had in the case of the uh, in the case of the fish we can send the blood back to the heart where it can pump again and by pumping it again we're able to rebuild that blood pressure and maintain good blood flow through the systemic loop all right the only kind of limitation of this is that we have two different receiving chambers for each circuit, but then both atria dump into a common ventricle. And so this is where the system is a little bit less efficient. All right. It's less efficient because um, it does allow a little bit of mixing of our oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So as it gets pumped back out again, um, we've diluted some of the oxygen content that came from the pulmocutaneous circuit. And so it's not as oxygen rich um, as it potentially could be. Um, the one thing though that has kind of evolved in these animals is when you look inside the ventricle, and you might remember seeing kind of a similar feature in the mammal heart, is that the ventricles are not perfectly smooth walled chambers. They have all these little bumps and ridges in them. Um, and so within the ventricles, those ridges kind of help to reduce the mixing of our deoxygenated blood coming from the systemic system and the oxygenated blood from the pulmocutaneous circuit. And so even though it gets pumped out, generally the less the deoxygenated blood goes into the pulmocutaneous circuit and the mostly oxygenated blood does go into the systemic circuit. All right. All right. Taylor asked a question. Uh, I talked about how the pulmocutaneous circuit delivers blood to the lungs, but what does the systemic loop do? The systemic loop delivers blood to all of the other parts of the body. So all of the other organs, brain, kidneys, digestive organs, muscles, all of that stuff. Okay. So that's what the systemic thing is. So you kind of think of all of the other body systems that an animal has, digestive system, urinary system, even certain aspects of the actual circulatory system itself, as you have some thick-walled blood vessels that actually need their own network of tiny capillaries within them in order to sustain those tissues. It, 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 you know, it, it's kind of weird. Even hearts need their own network of blood vessels to supply them with oxygen and nutrients. Um, we don't really get into it in this class, but there's the, all of these vessels called... Um, um, coronary blood vessels um, and those are the ones that if they get blocked um, lead to a heart attack okay oh we have a random um, person joining in on twitch hello there cuttlefish films um, this is not a high school this is woodland community college um, from woodland california so uh, welcome to a college class if you want to sit in and um, learn a little bit more about uh, circulatory systems All right, so back to our topic here. Um, so again, the um, double loop three chambered heart system is definitely an improvement over the single loop. Um, but things can be better, right? And so evolution has kind of come up with yet another, oops, another option here. The double loop circulation system but with a four chambered heart. So this is the system that um, um, that we, we already studied here because we see it in mammals, but it's also found in birds and it's found in crocodiles, all right? And those last two are kind of interesting because their evolutionary history is really that separate of mammals. Mammals branched off from some early reptilian ancestors, um, probably about Oh my gosh, I want to say at least 150 to 200 million years ago. Um, and then a bunch of reptiles um, after that point eventually evolved into a, a lineage of dinosaurs called the therapsid dinosaurs. 
and crocodiles and birds are the descendants of the therapsid dinosaurs. Right? And so they have this type of heart, but this is an example of what we call convergent evolution. So uh, the evolution of similar structures in two not so closely related groups of animals. And so it shows again that sometimes natural selection can really work um, to find um, the best solution to a problem in multiple time frames and just kind of through luck. All right, but the fundamental arrangement of a double loop four chambered heart circulatory system is the same in both of these. All right, so again, what do we have? Two circuits, pulmonary circuit, which again is just from the heart to the lungs and back to the heart again. And then just an ordinary systemic circuit. So again, from the heart out to all of the body systems and then back to the heart again. So we've studied this one in quite a bit of detail in lab already. Um, so again, the big difference is that rather than having the common ventricle, which had a little bit of mixing of blood, you now have a muscular septum or a wall that separates and it prevents deoxygenated blood from mixing with the oxygenated blood down here. So this is going to deliver um, the highest quality oxygenated blood, you know, the, the most saturated with oxygen is going to be traveling through the system um, and getting to all the major organs and tissues. So at this point, it maximizes oxygen delivery, and so it does support higher levels of metabolism. And again, we definitely see that in the case of mammals, and we also see that in birds. These are very, very active animals, um, and they also tend to be endothermic, so they have a very high internal metabolism that allows them to maintain a constant body temperature. What about crocodiles? Yeah, good question. Still fairly reptilian, okay, and I think for all practical purposes, they still tend to be ectothermic. So, seems to be a little side, you know, but maybe that was a minor, um, a minor loss of some metabolic activity. I think the big question is, what were dinosaurs? Were they endotherms or were they ectotherms? And paleontologists have been going back and forth on the debate about that for decades now, and I don't think they're any closer to a resolution now than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so if you find that kind of interesting and intriguing, go online, do a little digging, do a little research, and um, maybe kind of share some of that information with us. All right, because I honestly, I don't have an answer. All right. So where do we want to go from here? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to now kind of take a closer look at the functioning of a vertebrate heart. And again, just because of our familiarity with it, we're really going to focus in on the mammalian heart, um, which I think, again, has practical purposes for most of our students in this class who are looking at either going into human medicine or veterinary medicine, where you primarily deal with mammals um, in most of those cases. So I think that makes a lot of sense there. All right. So to understand, again, the role of the heart is to um, contract. So again, it's muscle tissue, and muscle tissue contracts. And particularly when you contract the ventricles of the heart, that squeezes on the heart, generates a large pulse of pressure that then forces it out through all of the major arteries and begins to get it delivered on its way through the blood vessels. All right. So we need to take a look at how the heart works. And so the heart works really on a cyclical system here. So we refer to this as the cardiac cycle. All right, so terminology first. It's always terminology in this class, isn't it? No, I get, that's the major role here. All right, you gotta learn the language of the science in order to better understand the concepts. So when we talk about contraction of the heart, okay, that term for that is known as systole. Right? So you pronounce the E at the end of this with a long E sound. So it's systole, refers to any time the heart, or at least a portion of the heart, is actively contracting. All right? But like any muscle, cannot stay contracted, because otherwise it would all the sarcomeres within the muscle tissues would remain kind of locked in place. And so there needs to be a period 
and the heart is not actively contracting and the muscle tissue can kind of be stretched back out again. And so there is a resting phase for heart muscle tissue called diastole. All right. so we have systole and we have diastole. So contraction and relaxation. And there's an alternation of these phases in order for the heart to work. All right. And again, in order for blood to circulate properly through the heart, you need to alternate when the different chambers are in contraction and relaxation. So first there has to be a period of atrial systole to help squeeze blood out of the atria, out of the chambers that are receiving blood. And then those can go into a rest. And while those are resting, then the ventricles can contract and the ventricles go into systole. And then after the ventricles contract, they get a diastole, they get a rest. So the cycle is just atrial systole, ventricular systole, and there's actually a period where both chambers are in relaxation at the same time, although it actually varies a little bit. Okay, so let me just give you an example from again data from the human, from the human heart. All right, and so we kind of look at this graphic right here. All right, so you can see that um, we can start again with a period when both the atria and the ventricles are in a resting phase or in diastole, and for a human heart, that's at a resting heart rate. Uh, resting, by the way refers to um, when a human is awake but not being terribly physically active. You know, you're just kind of sitting around just like you are now, you're in front of your device, just taking notes and casually watching TV. You're not doing necessarily a lot of physical activity. So you're on a resting heart rate. All right. So in a resting heart rate, diastole lasts about four tenths of a second. And that's when both chambers are completely relaxed and really what's happening during this period though is that blood is still streaming through the circulatory system blood doesn't like ever stop flowing it's always in a state of movement and so even though the heart is resting blood is entering through the vena cava into the right atrium of the heart or it's also coming in through the pulmonary veins entering the left atrium of the heart and the blood is actually filling up and because the heart is relaxed blood just simply flows from the vessels into the atria, but even the valves, if you remember, the bicuspid and the tricuspid valves that you guys studied in lab, those are relaxed. And so blood can simply trickle through those valves and you actually begin filling up the ventricles of the heart during this period of diastole. All right, so this is actually a key period of ventricular filling. All right, so that's probably why diastole uh, for both chambers lasts so long, four tenths of a second, it's going to give us that period to fill um, both ventricles with most of the blood that they are then going to eject when it comes time for a contraction. All right. Now, after that four tenths of a second of diastole, then atrial systole occurs and the muscle tissue of the atria contracts. And really what it does is just squeezes a final volume of blood from the atria and puts it into the ventricles, ventricles, kind of topping it off. That only takes about one-tenth of a second in the human heart because the atria are kind of small, thin-walled, and they don't have to generate a lot of force because the blood isn't traveling that far. It's just going from the upper chambers of the heart to the lower chambers of the heart. All right, now we get to ventricular systole while the atria go into diastole. So again, atria are in, are in systole for only one-tenth of a second, and then all the remaining time, that tissue is at rest. All right. But then ventricles, they go into, into sorry, systole, and as they go into systole, they have a long sustained contraction that lasts three-tenths of a second, all right? because they need to be able to force um, a decent volume of blood um, you know, several tens of milliliters is now going to be ejected out either through the aorta or through the pulmonary trunk. And there's also a lot more cardiac muscle tissue down here in the ventricles. Again, you guys have seen this in lab already, how thick the ventricles were. And so you need a little more time for all of that muscle tissue to contract and to generate the necessary force that's going to force the blood through. All right. And then three tenths of a second, we're done. And now again, we go into and restart the cycle over again.
where we have our common diastole. All right, and so that becomes the cycle. Atrial systole, ventricular systole, diastole. All right. So what can the blood do in one of these cycles? Well, it can pump quite a bit of blood. It can actually um, generate um, what we call cardiac output. Cardiac output is simply a question of how much blood does the heart pump in the course of a minute? All right. And this is a way of kind of measuring heart health and heart efficiency. Um, and it's kind of a very simple calculation, really. All right. To determine cardiac output, it, you have to look at two components. All right. First, you have to look at just, well, how fast is the heart beating? All right. So this is referred to as the heart rate, okay? simply the number of beats per minute. All right. And the beats, by the way, that's actually the sound of the valves of the heart closing. So um, officially, it's kind of described as a lub-dub sound. The lub would be the closing of the bicuspid and tricuspid valves, uh, collectively known as the atrioventricular valves, so the valves between the atria and the ventricles. So that's the first sound. When those slam, and that's actually the sound that you hear to signal the start of ventricular systole because as the ventricles contract, they pull on the chordae tendine that pulls the uh, tissue flaps of the valves closed against one another, and you get that audible thump or lub sound. All right. The dub sound okay, is the sound of the semilunar valves, the valves at the entrances to the aorta or the pulmonary trunk. And as those valves close down, that's the second heart sound. All right, But those sounds are what we refer to as, as the heartbeat, because that's what we listen to with a stethoscope and things like that. All right, so how quickly are you hearing those heart sounds? That's your heart rate. All right, The other component of cardiac output is the stroke volume. The stroke volume is just how much blood was ejected by the ventricles in one phase of systole, in one contraction. All right. And again, that can also be adjusted because the heart is still a muscle. And just like we talked about skeletal muscles, you can vary the strength of contraction by varying kind of how much of the heart kind of contracts. Okay, sorry, I was losing my volume there. All right. Um, can you still hear me, Jack? Check your own audio settings. I, my monitor tells me that I'm projecting at an adequate volume. No delay. All right. Well, hopefully you can uh, solve those issues here. I hope everybody else can still hear me. Okay, great. Thank you, Suki. Um, all right. So back to back to the stroke volume here. Again, the, the heart has the ability to kind of vary its strength of contraction, and therefore it can eject more or less blood. Hmm. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. Um, okay. Okay, got it. Okay, never mind. All right, so here we go. All right, I need to... Yeah, um, all right, well, uh, figure out how to mute. Okay, we're going to ignore that. All right, well, let me just get back to this. So an example, again, is human cardiac output here. All right, so kind of to look at it this way, assuming that a, a person has a resting heart rate of about 70 beats per minute, which is pretty average for a young adult, you know, between the ages of uh, 20 and 45, somewhere in there. And you have a stroke volume at rest of around 75 milliliters per beat. All right. So cardiac output is just multiplying them to
There we go. Thank you, Taylor. Appreciate the help. Blocked. Out of here. All right, so back to the equation here. So if you take the heart rate times the stroke volume and multiply it out, for a human, that works out to be about 5.25 liters per minute. All right. And you know the really cool thing about this? That's about the average volume of blood in an adult human. That is, each of us has, on average, around 5 liters of blood. So this means that when we're just sitting around doing nothing, we circulate our entire volume of blood through our bodies once every minute. And that actually kind of impressive, all right? And then when you think about when you like go and exercise or do some physical activity and your heart rate accelerates and if you get a good cardio workout where you double your heart rate and you get it up to like 140 beats per minute, now you're going to be able to um, circulate your entire blood volume in half that time. So every 30 seconds, your blood is making it through. And so that gives you a really, really rapid rate of delivery. All right. And that's really what the heart does. The heart is able to adjust to meet whatever your metabolic demands are. So when you are using a lot of muscle tissue, which consumes a lot of oxygen to make all that ATP to keep you guys functioning, you're going to have a much more accelerated heart rate and your stroke volume is also going to increase. The heart is going to contract with greater force to eject even larger volumes of blood at the same time. And so that's kind of how things work. And you can also make these sort of adjustments too to maintain, and again, really the purpose is to maintain proper blood pressure at all times to maintain the right blood flow. All right. Okay. Oh, I forgot to do the build on this one. All right. So a lot of information here, but um, we're kind of getting closer. We've got about five minutes left here. So let me at least try to introduce some of these concepts here, and then we're going to pick up on this um, next Tuesday. And so in order for the cardiac cycle to work, though, again, there has to be proper coordination um, of the contraction of the atria and then the ventricles, and then let them both have a rest here. All right. And in order to control this, what actually stimulates the different parts of the heart to contract is the spread of an action potential. All right? This is, again, just like we talked about in the nervous system, the action potential is that change in the voltage across cellular membranes because of a change in ion concentrations. It's fundamentally the same mechanism, although there, we're going to see sometimes different ions can be used to create these potentials here. Um, but it is the spread of this electrical impulse that is generated in first one part of the heart and the electrical impulse is then what directly stimulates the contraction process all right and, and if you remember from your study of muscle tissue you have an action potential spreads um, across the membranes of the heart to open calcium channels in sarcoplasmic reticulum to allow calcium to bind to troponin complexes you get the picture, right? You remember all of that detail there? That, that mechanism is still at play in the heart, all right? So you generate an action potential in one part of the heart and then allow it to spread through the cardiac muscle tissue um, to get the atria and then the ventricles to contract. The thing is, is that the timing is important because action potentials are transmitted almost instantaneously through tissue. And again, one of the other things that you guys studied about cardiac muscle tissue, if you remember cardiac muscle tissue, all of the cells were connected on their branch points where the branches come end to end. And there were those structures that we called intercalated discs. Those are gap junctions and they allow for the ions within one muscle cell to then flow through an adjoining muscle cell and it also then for allows the spread of voltage. It allows the spread of electrical current from one muscle cell to another muscle cell directly. So in other words, cardiac muscle cells are connected by electrical synapses. All right. So go, ahead. go back and check your notes on the nervous system. We were talking about synapses and we talked about electrical synapses. 
turns out that the heart is connected by electrical synapses. And that causes the action potential to spread almost instantaneously through the entire heart. But if it did that, it would cause the entire heart to try to contract simultaneously, meaning that the atria and the ventricles would contract at the same time, which would be counterproductive because we don't want to try to force blood from the ventricles into the atria while we're trying to get blood from the atria down into the ventricles. So it wouldn't be very efficient. So we need to make sure that there is good timing in which parts of the heart contract and also maintain that the heart contracts in sort of the right direction. Because we'll go back and we'll look at pictures of the heart, but the way the, the direction of blood flow is that blood enters in through the base of the heart, which is sort of the, the top or the superior end of the heart, and the, um, the apex of the heart, the, the pointed part of the heart, that's a blind ended sac. And so we gotta make sure that we're squeezing the blood in the right direction. And we'll kind of walk you through all of that um, when we get a chance. All right, but so in order to maintain this proper timing and direction, there is a special arrangement of cardiac muscle cells that form something we call the conduction system of the heart. And there are four features to it. There is one feature called the sinoatrial node Okay, which you guys might have heard about. It's something referred to as the natural pacemaker of the heart. This is actually the part of the heart that helps to set the heart rate. All right, and we'll explain how and how that works and why that works. Then there's another cluster of muscle cells called the atrioventricular node, or the AV node. All right, from there it goes into a special bundle of muscle cells called the bundle of Hiss which then forks into a couple of branches. And then finally, there are a series of muscle fibers called Purkinje fibers. And all of these are working together to make sure that the spread of the action potential is done in a controlled fashion, leading to a proper cardiac cycle. All right, but we are out of time for today. So we're going to wrap things up here, and we'll pick up on this point uh, next Tuesday here and try to get through uh, the rest of this chapter on that day. Um, so um, if at any point you have any questions, um, at least if you're in my class, if you have any questions, um, you can, of course, email me directly, or you can post them to the new General Questions Discussion Board that is in the Canvas shell, and we will get back and... Um, I'll respond uh, as quickly as I am able to get a hold of those things. Um, in the meantime, I remind you to keep up on the laboratory work, um, make things available. I haven't had time to research whether any more Shape of Life videos are available. Um, if I can find links to them, I'll get an announcement out and uh, post those links onto a page or something like that so that you guys can kind of keep up with that if you've been finding that series kind of interesting. Unfortunately, they're not generally available. They're kind of hidden around the internet and not all episodes are necessarily available, but I'm going to do what I can. Uh, so just kind of keep up on the lab work. And again, I'm going to figure out um, how to turn in lab notebooks as we know better what the school is doing. So thanks for uh, tuning in, everyone. Uh, I appreciate your participation. And um, we'll be back in class next Tuesday, 8 o'clock in the morning. Thanks a lot.